All right. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, and afternoon uh, for uh, the person who's in Europe. Um, I'll be there soon, too, hopefully. And uh, today we are planning to talk about the challenges of infrastructure orchestration, as well as talking about Starling X that if someone who's watching, listening, participating in this call doesn't know is an edge cloud platform, um, an open source project as well. So uh, if anyone got interested throughout um, this call to come and participate, you definitely can. The website is starlingx.io. So um, call to action to everyone who's not participating, but would like to, to go ahead and check it out. So um, when it comes to edge and orchestration and um, edge infrastructures in general, we all know that they can grow large and get really complex and can get hard, not just to deploy, but also perform the day two operations as we call them. We borrowed the term from the telecommunications industry. So uh, we are facing with a lot of headaches that some of it we saw in the large central data center um, area as well. And now they are breaking out to the edge and causing even bigger challenges. So um, we are here to discuss what the challenges are and also looking into the um, solution space. Um, I know that the topic is near and dear to Rob's heart, for instance. For instance. So um, virtually looking at Rob, um, if you have any um, like starter questions or uh, statements about the topic, or even just starting X, because you also said that you will have a lot of questions. <laughs> no, you just, you just opened up huge. Um, yeah, I, I, let me start with orchestration. I'd, I'd, I'd love to have the Starling X uh, team explaining, um, you know, the, without going too deep into the architecture, because I know there's a lot there, but the, the focus more on the orchestration and day two pieces. So one of the things that came up over the last year in our conversations is that um, edge sites have unique challenges. That's no surprise to anybody. One of the challenges is that um, their anticipation of them being man unstaffed or minimally staffed. So the idea of uh, human intervention at an edge site um, is, is less attractive, even if it's done from a uh, stretch control plane or a remote site. So the idea that you would have administrator, but you would have one administrator for multiple edge sites um, is it's still, um, it's okay, but it's still less attractive because the edge site loses autonomy uh, from those circumstances. So the idea with orchestration is to um, look at a site that's already up and running. Um, I think even up and running, you know, the, the day one challenges, I think also have some orchestration components, but I think the focus here has been on we've gotten it running. Then we have uh, an ongoing series of um, operational concerns around the site um, for everything from repeating day, day one work, like provisioning, reprovisioning, patching, um, validating OSs, adding new infrastructure to the, an existing site, decommissioning infrastructure from a site, um, responding to um, and patches and, and upgrades and changes would be at every level. Uh, dealing with monitoring events where uh, systems need to have routine disk purge or log purge, making sure that the systems are healthy, um, monitoring and responding to a security if something happened from a security event where uh, there was an intrusion detected um, or a network outage that the systems would be able to respond from that perspective. So the orchestration I'm trying to put this in sort of outcomes and, and, and um, objectives rather than the, the more simple, you know, building up a, a string of automation that handles, if this happens, then I do that. 
Um, and I'm going to add one more because that's orchestration in, in its very simplest form. And I think there's a, a secondary challenge with this, which is the orchestration logic for the edge, like most everything we talk about for edge, needs to be focused at the edge. So um, the, you know, to some extent, definitely not zero, maybe not 100, the, the site itself has to be able to uh, accommodate uh, those responsive actions. Uh, Beth, one of the things you and I talked about at the PTG was this idea that if alarms are generated, um, or alerts that they would be queued. You know, there has to be some reliable queuing mechanism for this. So, um, yeah, that's my intro. Go ahead, Beth, please. I was going to say, you can't have alarms just, um, you know, getting <laughs> not going anywhere on an edge site. They have to get to some something or someone who can actually do something about them. <laughs> and, and I actually add a an infrastructure as code layer on top of all that which says that you know, an edge site is not a unique snowflake. It needs to have some repeatable um, expectations. So the idea would be that you know, it's not just that you can do this on that site, it's also that you can define the orchestration requirements for an edge site in a way that creates a repeatable um, set of, of orchestration across, you know, so, so you can have a dev stage test, that you can have uh, edge sites that have repeated code and shared code infrastructure. Um, to me, that's, that, that we need to make sure that um, we don't think of an edge site solving a problem at a site. Um, to me, it's always a question of how do we solve edge concerns, orchestration, one of them, in a way that is scalable across, you know, hundreds and thousands. Yeah. So Greg, I know you and I have discussed this over the years, you know, how, how critically important, um, you know, that orchestration uh, layer has to be at the edge. It's, it's, it's not a nice to have, it is a must have. Uh, sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. Um, yeah, I definitely like uh, my experiences with Starling X is, yeah, we, you know, uh, like as you guys know, we Starling X provide, you know, supports, you know, standalone clouds, but we also support kind of a distributed cloud environment where, um, a, it, where it's for managing, you know, distributed deployments at the edge of the networks. And, and I think you guys also know that, you know, in Starling X, those distribute, distributed edge entities are, uh, are full clouds. They're not worker nodes, they're clouds. So in Starling X, we refer to them as sub clouds, but they're really completely, they're completely standalone cloud on their own, basically. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like, just because of you know the the sheer number of these uh, these clouds, like Starling X, well at least like as you guys know, like uh, I, I work at Wind River and we have a commercial deployment or commercial offering uh, based on Starling X, and it's you know probably ninety nine percent Starling X, um, but yeah our our experience with it has been uh, all around the 5G use cases. There's a number of users we have for 5G. And yeah, the numbers that, that they talk about with respect to the 5G and we'll not just talk about, they're, they're actually you know, deploying is yeah, in the, in the thousands, um, you know, even closing in on 100,000 uh, type edge deployments. So you can't do anything without, uh, uh, some strong <clears throat> orchestration capabilities, both for day one and day two um, stuff, as well as, yeah, just day two kind of monitoring type stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, we spend, and e we easily spend, you know, the bulk of our development in, uh, in Starling X 
um, in supporting, uh, um, you know, different orchestration activities to uh, to to support across the um, across the edge deployments, right? Like we have, you know, we have a zero touch provisioning because, you know, even to get up to the, you know, fifty or hundred thousand subclouds across the network, these users have to be like installing like. 100 subclouds a week or something. So you have to have a zero touch uh, provisioning uh, type solution. And, uh, and uh, so yeah, say, so we have orchestration for that. And then, and then there's all the day two stuff like the patching, the upgrade, you know, we even firmware upgrades, firmware updates for some of the you know, hardware acceleration devices that uh, some of these 5G users are using. Um, and uh, and then even orchestration on some of the certificate stuff, right? Like, like uh, a lot of our 5G, most of our 5G users are using strictly Kubernetes. And, and you guys know that Kubernetes, there's a, a million and one certificates uh, involved. So, uh, um, even managing uh, certificate management needs to get orchestrated or and or you know properly supporting auto renewals and stuff like that so that the operational overhead of managing certificates isn't isn't stupid um, but yeah like yeah like you were saying Beth like the, the orchestration is a is a key key topic yeah one of one of the things I'd like to like you to touch on if possible and this is just kind of my selfish <laughs> uh interest is that um you know on the some of the work products i've been working on within verizon it's becoming more and more obvious that you know um monitoring and reporting and slas which of course are super important in the telco world um you know really need um you know good metrics um to and to support um those activities you know being able to respond quickly to outages or um or or degradation or whatever and then be able to report on them accurately as it just so happens i've spent the last week pouring over an sla document you know legal document um for um uh, upcoming nas uh, i'm working on a nas offering and um, the, you know, the, the details of, you know, how we can deliver that is the, that's the devil, right? <laughs> um, because not only do we, you know, have to, to support this SLA, but we also have to um, uh, automate the giving of credits, right? And we have to base it. And obviously Verizon doesn't want to give credits all, all to customers you know, <laughs> willy nilly, obviously there's a business, business decisions there as well. Um, so we have to be able to say, oh yeah, this customer did in fact, you know, we did in fact violate the SLA and here are the metrics to support that. And, you know, and then automate that to say, hey, you got your credits, you know, because customers, are, that's a customer experience issue, right? That customers are going to be much happier if they get a credit because their service was poor one month um, without us, without them being telling us, right? <laughs> you know, if we tell them, hey guys, we noticed your, your, you know, your service was bad, you know, there was a problem with the equipment or whatever it was. And, oh, and by the way, here's your credit. Right. Um, yeah, actually for installing X proper, um, the metric solution, there actually is not a significant metric solution. Um, well, I wouldn't expect so, but you know, you need to have the hooks, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, and and that's what we do with our, I mean, that is one of the differences with our Wind River commercial offering on top of Starling X is that there, there is a metric solution on top of it, but it just sits on top of, you know, Kubernetes. It's not Prometheus based, although we're getting pushed that way, but uh, it's based on Elastic right now, but it's, it's 
it's just basic classic kind of metric collection from you know through uh you know kubernetes events mechanisms uh that can be you know that can have custom metrics for particular applications and that sort of thing and then it's just a and, and then it, that metric solution is just deployed you know deployed at the edge clouds and reports up into the reports up into the uh the central our central cloud for you know aggregation and filtering and and that sort of thing and then uh and then can be forwarded up into you know uh yeah you know a uh, customer specific higher level right. uh processing mechanism yeah stuff. that that would all be done on our end yeah right we, would, we wouldn't expect any generic system to have that functionality right right so yeah, so for metrics that I mean for Starling X does provide alarming type info. Um, uh, we like Starling X has you know a little like it's not anything fancy. It's just a little uh, um, alarm reporting mechanism for the Starling X infrastructure itself, and just implements you know a simple. You know, active alarm database and a historical database, and and the only orchestration we do at that level are for the alarms, like at the edge sites, is that uh, we just I forget how frequently we do it, or it might even be asynchronous. I, I don't know, but we really just only report we only report alarm counts up to uh, up to the central cloud, and the alarms themselves are just only stored. Uh, on the uh, on the edge clouds, and uh, um, so basically, if anybody monitoring at the central location, you know, sees an alarm count for an edge for an edge sub cloud, uh, you know, go up from non-zero, he can he he basically has to kind of drill down into the uh, into the particular edge sub cloud in order to kind of get the detailed information. Now they we do we do support. Starling X does support SNMP on all its devices. So you can also, you know, set up SNMP and get, you know, all these infra Starling X infrastructure alarms forwarded to, you know, your SNMP manager if you want, uh, want that sort of stuff. And, right. and yeah, SNMP is unreliable, but you can, you know, do the, you know, do the normal, you know, sweep the active alarm table, right. SNMP occasionally and stuff like that. So, uh, I, I'm curious about how you define alarms. Like part of the, this is part of my infrastructure is code curiosity, just as a framing. But you know, how are alarms defined, and how do you how do you propagate them through the system? Yeah. So, so, so when I'm talking about alarms in Starling X, these are uh, alarm alarm events for the Starling X infrastructure itself, because you probably know this, but, you know, Starling X manages, Starling X is basically deploying Kubernetes on top of bare metal, but we, we basically manage the physical servers, all the configuration for the physical servers, and then manage all the, and manage all the services that are running on, on those servers, like, uh, you know, all the, the Linux services that we, we leverage, the Starling X services themselves, as well as Kubernetes and and the and the all the kind of containerized services running on top of Kubernetes as well. So um, uh, so when I say alarm, I mean that this is an event. Uh, a Starling X alarm is reporting a an alarmable event on one of the infrastructure resources that Starling X is managing. It could be you know loss you know, loss of connectivity to a hardware node. It could be uh, an interface loss of signal. It could be that a uh, Kubernetes service can't get recovered properly or something like that. And, uh, and like I say, we just, we have a very simple um, uh, 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 fault management system, which is Starling X specific. Um, and uh, and it, it just provides an API for any Starling infrastructure service services to report or 
you know, to set or clear an alarm. And, uh, uh, and then uh, a, within a particular subcloud, because our subclouds can be single servers or yeah. multiple servers and stuff like that. So within a subcloud, uh, that, that API basically, you know, reports the alarm, you know, through kind of just classic queuing stuff within the, the worker nodes and the master nodes and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, do you have, do you have any alarms on like, um, let's see patching or, um, you know, installation, um, potential failures or, you know, configuration mismatches, you know, checks on stuff. Yep. We, yep, we do. We, uh, we, there is, I, I believe it's in our, do, our Starling X docs, but we have a list of all the Starling X infrastructure alarms that that we do generate and yeah there are alarms that, you know if if a patch fails or um let me just see if i can find uh fault management yeah like oops oh, crap. Uh, where's the chat here? Um, like this is the oh, perfect. Thanks. That's a top. So there's a whole series of alarms there that can get set and cleared. And yeah, you like if failures occur on patching or upgrades or installation, alarms will get raised. A lot of times, in order to actually fully diagnose it, you have to dive into you know lower level log messages in order to actually diagnose you know what's the real problem and that's something we're trying to fix and 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 uh, and it is actually you know a uh, um a, a scalability issue is that you know you know given our users are doing you know Hundred subcloud installs a day, and uh, and then you know Starling X is rolling out a new release every six months, so you know they have to do an upgrade across mm -hmm. across you know uh, you know twenty thousand uh, subclouds every six months and stuff like that. That that a lot of times things fail, right? Like, you know, not necessarily because of Starling X software issues, but because of you know, network connectivity issues or latent, latency issues and our, uh, you know, server fault type things. And uh, um, and so we're getting a lot of pressure about, you know, making the, um, you know, error messages for installs and upgrades and patches, uh, you know, much easier to access um, and uh, much better at kind of pointing to root cause. Uh, um uh in order to be able to detect the uh um detect and fix the errors quickly right because like i said they're trying to do 100 installs a day um and then the other the other aspect is that the uh, you know right now right now for starling x installs that fail or or even the upgrades that fail it's sort of a start from the beginning to, you know, after you fix your problem, start from the beginning. And so that's another big request is that, okay, if I'm 90% of the way through my upgrade, I don't want to start from the beginning. Um, so, uh, so, so that's another big yeah. feature that we're getting. Yeah, uh, that's actually a big problem for particularly when you have, um, uh, you want to minimize your downtime window, you know, in, in uh, telecom apps, of course, yeah. you want to minimize the downtime window. <laughs> Yeah, the other, the other um, uh, kind of, I don't know, it's maybe more than usability thing is that uh, um, the other thing we find on a lot of our users in this 5G distributed cloud scenario is that the, the, net, the network quality between the central cloud and the, uh, uh, the edge sites is very poor. Um, it's... Uh, like the latency, the, the, the latency can be as high as 150 to 200 milliseconds. I think it's typically 25 to 50 milliseconds, but it be, but the latency can be quite high. And the 
and the bandwidth between a central cloud and a remote uh, subcloud can be as low as 100 megabits per second. So you've got crappy yeah. band. Crappy oh, band. yeah, we, we see that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. So, so, so one thing that we did in our last release was, um, you know, our upgrade scenario, uh, you know, was doing stuff like uh, downloading, downloading the new software loads and downloading the new container images during the uh, out of service window on an upgrade. So when you're only doing 100 megabits per second, uh, that uh, um, uh, that puts a big that puts a big chunk of time in your uh, uh, out of service window. Um, so yeah, uh, we we've definitely experienced that. Um, we have a lot of customers who complain about that because yeah, I actually did a little chart of based on your, your bandwidth. And based on the size of the image that we need to download for your upgrade, it's going to take X number of minutes to hours. <laughs> to yeah, because and especially because a lot of our 5G users, um, the way they're deploying at the edge is they want a super small footprint at the edge. Right. Uh, so it's really single server at the edge. So... Uh, um, they're not doing any protection at individual sites. The protection must be, I've never talked to oh, them. Oh, I, I know exactly how it's done. It's, yeah, the protection is in, in um, because it's a mesh. Right. I, I, that's what I was thinking. It's the protection must be just being provided by adjacent. Uh, yeah. Adjacent DUs, yeah. Not, uh, so not at individual DU sites or RU sites. So, so that means that when you upgrade that, that particular site, is because it only has a single server and it has no HA at the site itself that 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 site is out of service for for a certain period of time. So one of the things that we did in the last Starling X release uh, was that uh, we changed both the install and the upgrade to well we didn't change them. You have the option uh, in both the install and the upgrades to pre pre stage as much information as possible. Uh, like you know isos and container images and and any other stuff you can pre-stage that all you know outside of the main upgrade window uh, as well you're still providing service um so uh, so a lot of these 5g guys now are you know when the single server ship from the factory they already have the load on them so there's no requirement to download the loads the their initial load from the central the, the central control controller to the uh, the sub cloud and then like I say on then on upgrades the, there's basically there's there's basically an in-service pre-staging step that uh, can be done to kind of you know download all the you know the new ISO for the upgrade and the new container images for the upgrade and that sort of thing so I, I unfortunately have to drop, so I will listen to the recording for the rest of this call. All right. I'm still here. I was, I mean, right. <clears throat> um, I mean, what, what you're describing to me is, you know, those are, sort of classic orchestration concerns. I, I was, I guess I'm curious about how, like is, is there a orchestration subsystem? Did you build something that can handle um, the logic for it? Because what, you know, everything, having a person push a button to do a pre-staging or something like that isn't, isn't particularly attractive or even knowing that something's pre-staged and having a way to evaluate that that was done. Um, yeah, the, what's that what's that subsystem look like yeah yeah like and so and when i say orchestration um in starting x we kind of in all, all the orchestration implementation we have is kind of you know from scratch homebrew type stuff we haven't uh, based it on any uh orchestration uh you know uh, open source framework or anything like that but um, not that we shouldn't have, but uh, it just happened that way. 
Um, but when I say orchestration, there's actually two levels of orchestration that we do in Starling X. Uh, so, so like I've been saying is that if you look at any standalone cloud, whether you know it's truly standalone or whether it's a central cloud or whether it's the edge sub cloud, uh, like as you know, th those individual clouds can have multiple nodes, right? They can have one or two masters, they can have you know one to a hundred worker nodes and stuff like that. And so even infrastructure management within a cloud um, uh, requires orchestration as soon as the cloud starts getting big, right? Because um, you know, even applying a patch to a multi-node cloud, right? But you don't you don't want to manually go around to each uh, each node within the cloud to uh, to do the upgrade. So we build in so we built in some an orchestration layer that that basically you know iterates through the the nodes and uh, um, you know does it in the appropriate order, right? Updating masters first and then worker nodes and just walking right. through walking through. Yes. The I guess there's a, there's a question for me that I've been struggling with, right? Some of what you're describing is automation. So if I built a script that, that sequences these operations across multiple nodes, I, I would still consider that automation right. or workflow. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's squarely within the infrastructure's code realm of, right, I'm writing you know, uh, some type of some type of automation that that coordinates these these actions, right? And that that could involve talking to a Kubernetes cluster, that, you know, for you or like you were saying, uh, doing uh, coordinating uh, patches or updates to the BIOS, to specialized hardware, to operating systems, to the Kubernetes itself. All of that's the automation. What I've been what I've been working towards is there's another piece in here which is coordinating that orchestration or that automation, that's where the orchestration comes in. So when you say, hey, um, you know, after my, um, you know, uh, let me think if, you know, if I, if when my system hits this issue, this alert, then I need you to run this reactive script to it. Um, that if then uh, do that logic okay. in, in the system. Um, which, which in an edge site, I mean, you, I think you're doing a good job describing it. It's, hey, something happened. I'm out of compliance here. You know, my script, of, the script failed. Um, I want you to run a remediation task um, from that perspective. Then you should be able to come in and say, all right, let me define a body of remediation tasks and then distribute those as part of the edge definition. Which, and they might not have been anticipated in the script. So it's a whole, it's a whole, um, body of uh, site management logic that would exist, you know, to keep the systems going. Great, thanks, Sam. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess we, you're right that I'm using the word orchestration, but it's generally, it, it generally really is automation that that we have um, functions that can automate different operations and we do it at, and like I was saying we do it at two levels we can do it at within a cloud level like automate through all the nodes of a particular cloud but then we also do it at the at the distributed cloud layer where we can automate across all the sub clouds which are clouds on their own right and so so when you when you do that automation at the distributed cloud level, when you automate activities across the all the, the subclouds, it's really like a two two level um, automation because uh, the automation at the central cloud that's going across all the subclouds, it's really just triggering right. off automation at the subcloud level that's going across all the nodes, sort of thing. But you're right; it's just automation. There's, I don't think we have we have very little uh, that is of the scenario where we detect an event and then turn around and execute some you know remedial action sort of thing the um 
the only, well, maybe not the only, but the, I mean, we do have some uh, of that kind of automated reaction type stuff built into, or built into some of the certificate stuff, although it's a bit of a hand waving to say we do that. Um, we really just leverage cert manager to automatically renew our certificates. So, you know, uh, so, so if, if certificates start getting close to expiry, um, then, uh, you know, cert manager will basically trigger a, uh, a renewal process that, uh, that automatically, uh, will happen and that will happen independent of where that certificate is, whether it's on the sub cloud or the central cloud or something like that. But you're, 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 you're kind of more interested in the kind of maintaining the sub clouds by, you know, detecting issues and automatically, you know, spawning some remedial action against that issue. I, well, that's, I've, I'm definitely, we're, we've been working towards processes that do that. Um, and also um, distinguishing between work that is, <clears throat> excuse me, workflow and what we've been calling work order. So the idea of um, you have a you know, day one operation or a building operation, which is a, you know, a long automated sequence that changes the state of something. And then uh, looking at the same infrastructure, but in a day two mode, day two mode and maybe this is oversimplifying it, but th it's, it's, it's part of orchestration and it's not, this is what's interesting for me to talk through. If you look at the piece of equipment and say, all right, I now have a running Kubernetes cluster, or I have a system that's running, or I have uh, you know, certificate management is a good example. It's not really a, a classic provisioning or configuration <laughs> operation. It's a it's a day two or you know it's not orchestration either. It's automation. So you have a task that says I'm going to rotate certificates or build a Helm chart or something like that. That we've been talking about not as workflow but work order. And for those you would you would, you need different types of logic. You need queuing, so you can schedule them. You might have um, you know, different, different, different semantics about what happens and when it happens. And then um, for us, once the work order pieces uh, got established, so you could issue ad hoc, hey, here's my, ad, you know, I need this done, I need this done, I need this done. Then um, putting the, hey, an event happened, then do that for me, where right? stop, or, or it's, a, it's midnight. Run this, run this check task, or run this this task. Um, yeah, and that's so that all that stuff together. I've been. This is where the conversation gets interesting. All that stuff together to me feels more orchestrationy than we've talked about in the past. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, like the experience that we're having with our five G users right now are much more in the, you know, providing support for you know, uh, manually triggered automation activities. <laughs> so right. like they, and, and, and trying to get it so that those manually triggered automated automation activities like install, like upgrades, like patching, uh, all can work efficiently and and yet, and you know, re reliably, and be it, you know, and, and like I mentioned earlier, just and you know, if they do fail, make it easy to figure out how they failed and and uh, and restart them, sort of thing. So, yeah, we have not in our five G use cases so far. We haven't evolved to uh, um, we haven't evolved to the okay detect the. Uh, detect some issue and trigger uh, uh, and trigger some action because of it, other than, you know, a few small little things like cert managers and stuff like that. Gotcha. Like, like that was 5G guys, there's some 5G guys, like, you know, how I mentioned the, the network in between the central and the sub clouds is poor. There's some of our 5G users that, that, the network is also even just poorly managed. Like they, they, 
the network that connect the con kind of control network that connects the the central and the sub clouds you know sometimes yeah. it can get broken just because somebody accidentally removed a static route or something like that and it can be out for days and even though <laughs> even yeah. even though the central cloud is reporting an alarm saying i can't talk to these 10 sub clouds um the this 5g service guy service teams to seem to ah, well the 5g is still working so they so they they seem to be slow on uh, on uh, addressing uh, even fundamental issues like I can't even talk to the supply. Right. No, it's, these are I think they're especially at, at the speeds that you're talking about. You know, having something that you can replicate that setup and make it increasingly easy to automate is, is that's critical because yeah. you're right they're not gonna you know they're, they're gonna have to be able to work with in, inconsistent network and not and not break it's hard yeah. it's, it's a really hard problem this is why i i think and this is what what we sort of got to in the last ttg with orchestration is the ability to define a site that has behave you know define site behaviors so that it's resilient in those cases in a lot of cases you can't know them in advance you're going to have to be able to to add them to your infrastructure as code description of the site and then you know all the sites are going to need that that ability to respond yeah right that's the that's sort of the definition it's like oh okay i i know how to provision a site I can write a script that does that um and then you can make that more resilient over time so that that you know you're handling more contingencies um, but then the, then after it's up, you want to be able to build a catalog of uh, operational logic that helps re, you know re, re, ma maintain the site. Or if something's going wrong, at least queue up you know alerts that will eventually get sent or will be acknowledged uh, on the site, not rely on the centralized site. Right, right. That's the, yeah. yeah. Like in Starling X, like in Starling X you uh, like although although um, um, you know the central cloud is managing um, the sub clouds from a you know maintaining connectivity and and like uh, you know uh, control access for running these automation things and and also doing some level of you know sweeping up alarm counts and stuff like that um although you can although you you can do all that you know through the central cloud um each of the individual subclouds can also you know have their own external interfaces obviously so that mm -hmm. you, you know you can you know if you have lost connectivity between your central cloud and the the, the subcloud you can just talk directly to the api endpoints of the uh, of the subcloud and um, so you can do that. And then, like I mentioned before, is it as far as alarming and logging type stuff? I mean, you could turn SNMP on, you could configure SNMP on all your subclouds and have them all report to SNMP managers and, and have hmm. that as sort of a backup of, uh, you know, if I lose connectivity to my central cloud, I can still, you know, get observability of, you know, errors happening at my all my infrastructure for the subclouds through SNMP. Right, and then then you would then the SNMP infrastructure would be able to have a trigger because that's usually what you the, the monitors would have some some outage or control trigger. Yeah, I think the other the other trigger type stuff um, is, but actually, it, the other trigger type stuff that I've seen in um again again this is the wind river commercial starling x offering is we talked earlier about the uh, talked earlier about the uh, metric collection and the metric kind of event more generally event collection that the uh, um the that wind river provides on top of the starling x uh environment um collects 
you know, not just metrics, but, uh, you know, uh, um, like detailed log files, as well as, you know, Starling X uh, fault management alarms and logs and stuff like that. So it collects all those things. And, uh, um, and like I say, it does provide some, you know, aggregation and filtering of those, um, of those uh, uh, events. But I, I know, I don't think we've implemented any of it, but I know that that engine is targeted as also doing, I forget what the term is for it, but kind of some, you know, uh, kind of control loopback type uh, activities where, you know, it's looking across all the logs, all the alarms, all the metrics that are being reported in from, you know, across all the subclouds in the distributed cloud environment um, and, uh, you know, making kind of intelligent decisions as to, you know, the, the health of the system and what activities actually need to be, you know, automatically triggered. So I think some of that is, at least in the Wind River commercial offering is being targeted as as uh, being done at that uh, analytics uh, application level, as opposed to the what, what, we, what we had been calling orchestration with, but like you've been saying, it's really more of an automation type uh, thing. Right. I this, this is a this is a dilemma. Um, in in edge, I, I think we we this is it's more okay in enterprise infrastructures where it's you know people have that infrastructure available. Um, for the edge for the edge pieces, there's a you know and this is what I've been struggling with and why I'm, I'm excited for the call is you know you're building this minimal site um, with one you know, one one node. Or you know, just a couple of nodes. Um, this this day two work that we're talking about does need to get done. It needs to be coordinated. It's either going to be you know, or, and we we don't have the bandwidth to bolt on more um, big data center tech. Um, it, it's going to have to be you know, uh, small <laughs> small. Sorry, because you're already and I didn't ask. Uh, this is was. You know, if you're doing a full Kubernetes for a one node machine, it's, it's really not that much overhead. It's just, uh, um, but it's, you know. It's, yeah, the, the Starling X platform overhead with Kubernetes is only one core. So I think that was always, yeah. So I think they're, like, I think our typical 5G users deploy like a single socket Ice Lake server with, I think, 32 or 16 cores. I can't remember. But the yes. platform, the Starling X platform itself only uses one core and the, the remaining cores are all available for the apps. Makes sense. Yeah, I, at the end of the day, it, you know, managing one machine with, I mean, this is best, one of the best specialties, right? Even a, a single, a, a full open stack system on a single machine, the, the demands on that system are really low. So it's not like even the software is really busy um, doing the work. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, the thing the thing I've looked at is K three S as a as, you know the main you know eliminating SED from the system um, in those cases, but Kubernetes itself is not a lot of overhead for one one especially one system where there's no scheduling. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that familiar with the K three S stuff. What did you what did you say it eliminates? It eliminates SED. So the one of the design decisions it's, it's Kubernetes, but what they did was they swapped out the backing store to uh, MySQL, I think, or SQLite. Um, and so instead of having a full, which makes it then harder to HA, but really the only binary difference, they, other, they also bundled in just to keep things simpler, they bundled uh, KubeCuddle into the binary, they bundled the utilities into that one binary. So there's one binary, it doesn't require, um, it includes container D, so you don't have to install that separately. It's nice. It's it's for for that for this this use case. It's like okay, I don't have to patch or version four things to do Kubernetes. I just have 
one binary, and that's my container D, it's my storage, it's my mm -hmm. cuddle. Um, so okay. for this use case, and it's still it's still all the Kubernetes stuff. Just go like we do the same thing with our GoLang stuff. We keep adding utilities that we need into the binary because it's so easy to package additional functionality into the binary without it being becoming uh, bloated right. or overloaded. Like we, for us, it was JQ. Like we use JQ everywhere, so we just added JQ into the CLI binary. Okay. Um, and that's proven just absolutely beautifully useful because now we never worry about whether we have JQ available for all the JSON processing we have to do. Um, hmm. Cool. Yeah, all right. That's, I, and, and this this was the thing I was really curious about with Starling X because y'all are building such a deep stack of of tech, right? There's a whole bunch of pieces that have to all fit together, um, and so keeping all that in sync is hard. So part of the orchestration challenge. Right, right. Yeah, I mean the, um, yeah, like I mean the, the patching that we do at the Starling X level, I mean, Starling X actually defines like a, um, a, a patch bundle that can have, you know, arbitrary number of RPM. So at the user level, you know, the, the, at the user level, a user is applying, you know, patch three or something of, uh, on a, on a Starling X release. Um, but for that patch three, you know, may have, you know, a number of RPMs and, and a number of container images that are getting, you know, uh, a patch as part of that single uh, 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 that that single patch uh, um, uh, command basically. Right, that makes perfect sense to me. No, it's, and this is this is hard. The the automation in those case, and we're we're just about out of time. The auto the automation becomes increasingly. Um, this is why infrastructure as code becomes so important, right? It, it, you could easily start building very um, fur, uh, furry, um, hairy. Um, I mean, it has all these, all these little extra uh, edge cases built into it automation, which is good, but you then have to manage that too. Right. It's hard. These are hard problems. <laughs> They're very hard problems. Yep, yep, definitely. Yeah, that was an interesting discussion, yeah. Thank you all. Uh... We have one whole minute left. Um, do you all want to continue this discussion or do you feel that you got to the bottom of what you planned for today? I feel smarter about Starling X and that was really helpful. Um, I, I, if, if people want, I can go back through and do show off, show some of the orchestration pieces that we've been building. Um, so you can understand the basis of some of my questions. I'm happy to do that uh, also, if you want, because this is, I've been thinking about this, obviously I've been thinking about this a lot um, as far as how, how you build and propagate, um, you know, maintainable systems. In, in, in what context are you building this stuff in, Rob? So, so we, we maintain a uh, product called Digital Rebar um, that does, um, all sorts of data center infrastructure automation and cloud automation. So um, one of the things I've been curious about is, you know, if we could incorporate uh, what Starling X does, because we don't have a hypervisor uh, or even a real Kubernetes distro. Um, we're really about the orchestration and the provisioning configuration. So it's, it's interesting to me to see where uh, when we're building up a full stack of things, how different all those different pieces are being orchestrated. It's part of the challenges that we're working on. And then how do we build the platforms that our customers want around that? Right. Right. So but we, we, we do, a, you know, we've been adding, um, looking at the clock, um, we, we, we used to get a lot of monitoring conversations, what we thought were monitoring requests that were actually orchestration requests. 
And we didn't realize that until we started having orchestration and people were like, oh, I don't need the monitoring anymore. I could just, I could just do this trigger or this event. And uh, you've, you've solved my problem because I didn't actually need monitoring. Right. Um, hey, I, I got to run as well. Uh, again, getting pinged for, right, another, for another meeting. But yeah, this was a good discussion. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you all. Let's follow up on, on yeah, that's fine. your stuff next week. Um, I can uh, send out an email to the edge computing mailing list uh, for people to uh, to know, and I will also add that to the agenda. And then we can also discuss if people thought about the PTG or not, and those kind of things. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Have a good rest of your day.